idea in her head she hailed an approaching omnibus with such a hasty gesture that the daisies flew out of the pot and were badly damaged. "'This is not our omnibus,' said the professor, waving the loaded vehicle away and stopping to pick up the poor little flowers. "'I beg your pardon. I didn't see the name distinctly. Never mind, I can walk. I'm used to plodding in the mud,' returned Joe, winking hard, because she would have died rather than openly wipe her eyes. Mr. Bear saw the drops on her cheeks, though she turned her head away. The sight seemed to touch him very much, for suddenly stooping down he asked in a tone that meant a great deal. "'Heart's dearest, why do you cry?' Now if Jo had not been new to this sort of thing, she would have said she wasn't crying, had a cold in her head, or told any other feminine fib proper to the occasion. Instead of which that undignified creature answered with an irrepressible sob, "'Because you are going away!' "'Ach, mein Gott, that is so good!' cried Mr. Bear, managing to clasp his hands in spite of the umbrella and the bundles. "'Joe, I have nothing but much love to give you. I came to see if you could care for it, and I waited to be sure that I was something more than a friend. Am I? Can you make a little place in your heart for old Fritz?' he added, all in one breath. "'Oh, yes!' said Joe and he was quite satisfied, for she folded both hands over his arm, and looked up at him with an expression that plainly showed how happy she would be to walk through life beside him, even though she had no better shelter than the old umbrella, if he carried it. It was certainly proposing under difficulties, for even if he had desired to do so, Mr. Bear could not go down upon his knees on account of the mud. Neither could he offer Joe his hand, except figuratively, for both were full. Much less could he indulge in tender remonstrations in the open street, though he was near it. So the only way in which he could express his rapture was to look at her, with an expression which glorified his face to such a degree that there actually seemed to be little rainbows in the drops that sparkled on his beard. If he had not loved Jo very much, I don't think he could have done it then, for she looked far from lovely, with her skirts in a deplorable state, her rubber boots splashed to the ankle and her bonnet a ruin. Fortunately, Mr. Bayer considered her the most beautiful woman living, and she found him more Jove-like than ever, though his hat-brim was quite limp with the little rills trickling thence upon his shoulders, for he held the umbrella all over Joe, and every finger of his gloves needed mending. Passers-by probably thought them a pair of harmless lunatics, for they entirely forgot to hail a bus, and strolled leisurely along, oblivious of deepening dusk and fog. Little they cared what anybody else thought, for they were enjoying the happy hour that seldom comes but once in any life, the magical moment which bestows youth on the old, beauty on the plain, wealth on the poor, and gives human hearts a foretaste of heaven. The professor looked as if he had conquered a kingdom, and the world had nothing more to offer him in the way of bliss. While Jo trudged beside him, feeling as if her place had always been there, and wondering how she could have chosen any other lot. Of course she was the first to speak, intelligibly, I mean, for the emotional remarks which followed her impetuous, oh, yes, were not of a coherent or reportable character. Friedrich, why didn't you— Ah, heaven, she gives me the name that no one speaks since Minna died, cried the professor, pausing in a puddle to regard her with grateful delight. I always call you so to myself. I forgot. But I won't unless you like it. Like it? It is more sweet to me that I can tell. Say thou also, and I shall say your language is almost as beautiful as mine. Isn't thou a little sentimental? asked Joe, privately thinking it a lovely monosyllable. Sentimental? Yes. Thank God, we Germans believe in sentiment, and keep ourselves young mid it. Your English you is so cold. Say thou, heart's dearest. It means so much to me," pleaded Mr. Bear, more like a romantic student than a grave professor. "'Well, then, why didn't thou tell me all this sooner?' asked Joe bashfully. "'Now I shall have to show thee all my heart, and I so gladly will, because thou must take care of it hereafter. See then, my Joe. Ah, the dear, funny little name! I had a wish to tell something the day I said good-bye in New York, but I thought the handsome friend was betrothed to thee, 
and so I spoke not. Wouldst thou have said yes then, if I had spoken? I don't know. I'm afraid not, for I didn't have any heart just then. Prat, that I do not believe. It was a sleep, till the fairy prince came through the wood and waked it up. Ah, well, the erste Liebe is the beste, but that I should not expect. Yes, the first love is the best. But be so contented, for I never had another. Teddy was only a boy, and soon got over his little fancy," said Joe, anxious to correct the professor's mistake. Good, then I shall rest happy, and be sure that thou givest me all. I have waited so long, I am grown selfish, as thou wilt find, Professorin. I like that, cried Joe, delighted with her new name. Now tell me what brought you at last, just when I wanted you. This. And Mr. Bear took a little worn paper out of his waistcoat pocket. Joe unfolded it and looked much abashed, for it was one of her own contributions to a paper that paid for poetry, which accounted for her sending it an occasional attempt. How could that bring you? she asked, wondering what he meant. I found it by chance. I knew it by the names and the initials, and in it there was one little verse that seemed to call me. Read and find him. I will see that you go not in the wet. In the garret. Four little chests, all in a row, dim with dust and worn by time, all fashioned and filled long ago, by children now in their prime. Four little keys hung side by side, with faded ribbons, brave and gay, when fastened there with childish pride, long ago, on a rainy day. Four little names, one on each lid, carved out by a boyish hand, and underneath there lieth hid histories of the happy band, once playing here and pausing oft to hear the sweet refrain that came and went on the roof aloft in the falling summer rain. Meg on the first lid, smooth and fair, I look in with loving eyes, for folded here with well-known care a goodly gathering lies, the record of a peaceful life. Gifts to gentle child and girl, a bridal gown, lines to a wife, a tiny shoe, a baby curl. No toys in this first chest remain, for all are carried away, in their old age to join again in another small Meg's play. Ah, happy mother, well I know you hear like a sweet refrain, lullabies ever soft and low, in the falling summer rain. Joe on the next lid scratched and worn, and within a motley store, of headless dolls, of school-books torn, birds and beasts that speak no more, spoils brought home from the fairy ground only trod by youthful feet, dreams of a future never found, memories of a past still sweet, half-writ poems, stories wild, April letters warm and cold, diaries of a willful child, hints of a woman early old a woman in a lonely home, hearing like a sad refrain, Be worthy, love, and love will come, in the falling summer rain. My Beth, the dust is always swept from the lid that bears your name, as if by loving eyes that wept, by careful hands that often came. Death canonized for us one saint, ever less human than divine, and still we lay with tender plaint, relics in this household shrine, the silver bell so seldom rung, the little cap which last she wore, the fair dead Catherine that hung by angels born above her door, the songs she sang without lament in her prison-house of pain, forever are they sweetly blent with the falling summer rain. Upon the last lid's polished field, legend now both fair and true, a gallant knight bears on his shield Amy, in letters gold and blue. Within lie snoods that bound her hair, slippers that have danced their last, faded flowers laid by with care, fans whose airy toils are past, gay valentines, all ardent flames, trifles that have borne their part, in girlish hopes and fears and shames, the record of a maiden heart, now learning fairer, truer spells, hearing like a blithe refrain, the silver sound of bridal bells in the falling summer rain. Four little chests, all in a row, dim with dust and worn by time, 
for women, taught by weal and woe to love and labour in their prime. For sisters, parted for an hour, none lost, one only gone before, made by love's immortal power, nearest and dearest evermore. O oh, when these hidden stores of ours lie open to the Father's sight, may they be rich in golden hours, deeds that show fairer for the light, lives whose praise music long shall ring, like a spirit stirring strain, souls that shall gladly soar and sing in the long sunshine after rain. It's very bad poetry, but I felt it when I wrote it, one day when I was very lonely and had a good cry on a rag-bag. I never thought it would go where it could tell tales," said Joe, tearing up the verses the professor had treasured so long. Let it go, it has done its duty, and I will have a fresh one when I read all the brown book in which she keeps her little secrets," said Mr. Bear, with a smile as he watched the fragments fly away on the wind. I read that, and I think to myself, she has a sorrow, she is lonely, she would find comfort in true love. I have a heart full, full for her. Shall I not go and say, if this is not too poor a thing to give for what I shall hope to receive, take it in God's name. And so you came to find that it was not too poor, but the one precious thing I needed," whispered Joe. I had no courage to think that at first. Heavenly kind as was your welcome to me. But soon I began to hope, and then I said, I will have her if I die for it, and so I will," cried Mr. Bear, with a defiant nod, as if the walls of mist closing round them were barriers which he was to surmount or valiantly knock down. Joe thought that was splendid, and resolved to be worthy of her knight, though he did not come prancing on a charger in gorgeous array. "'What made you stay away so long?' she asked presently finding it so pleasant to ask confidential questions and get delightful answers that she could not keep silent. It was not easy, but I could not find the heart to take you from that so happy home, until I could have a prospect of one to give you, after much time, perhaps, and hard work. How could I ask you to give up so much for a poor old fellow, who has no fortune but a little learning? I'm glad you were poor. I couldn't bear a rich husband," said Joe decidedly, adding in a softer tone, "'Don't fear poverty. I've known it long enough to lose my dread and be happy working for those I love. And don't call yourself old. Forty is the prime of life. I couldn't help loving you if you were seventy. The professor found that so touching that he would have been glad of his handkerchief if he could have got at it. As he couldn't, Joe wiped his eyes for him and said, laughing as she took away a bundle or two, "'I may be strong-minded, but no one can say I'm out of my sphere now, for woman's special mission is supposed to be drying tears and bearing burdens. I'm to carry my share, Friedrich, and help to earn the home. Make up your mind to that, or I'll never go,' she added resolutely, as he tried to reclaim his load. "'We shall see. Have you patience to wait a long time, Joe? I must go away and do my work alone.' I must help my boys first, because, even for you, I may not break my word to Minna. Can you forgive that, and be happy while we hope and wait?" Yes, I know I can, for we love one another, and that makes all the rest easy to bear. I have my duty, also, and my work. I couldn't enjoy myself if I neglected them even for you, so there's no need of hurry or impatience. You can do your part out west, I can do mine here and both be happy hoping for the best, and leaving the future to be as God wills. Ah, thou givest me so much hope and courage, and I have nothing to give back but a full heart and these empty hands," cried the professor, quite overcome. Joe never, never would learn to be proper, for when he said that as they stood upon the steps, she just put both hands into his, whispering tenderly, Not empty now, and stooping down, kissed her Friedrich under the umbrella. It was dreadful, but she would have done it if the flock of draggle-tailed sparrows on the hedge had been human beings, for she was very far gone indeed, and quite regardless of everything but her own happiness. Though it came in such a very simple guise, that was the crowning moment of both their lives, when turning from the night and storm and loneliness to the household light and warmth and peace waiting to receive them, with a glad, 
Welcome home. Joe led her lover in and shut the door. End of chapter 46